Okay, today, uh, encounters with Jesus, some of these encounters with Jesus are very uplifting. Like we saw last week where uh, there was a son and a dad and the son had been oppressed by an evil spirit, radically freed by Jesus in their encounter. The father, radically freed uh, because of how Jesus had delivered his son. The whole community glorifying God because of what he had done. And uh, some of the encounters with Jesus are going to be a little bit more, uh, I mean, maybe a little bit more like today. So let me read today's passage, this encounter with Jesus. Uh, this is when the religious leaders met Jesus. And Jesus, man, he's, he is so kind and gentle to the lowly and the brokenhearted. And he reserves some very choice words for the oppressive religious leaders of his day. And you have some of those words to say today. Let's have a read. This is from Matthew 16. The Pharisees and the Sadducees approached and tested him, that's Jesus, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left and went away. The disciples reached the other shore and they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus told them, watch out and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were discussing among themselves, we didn't bring any bread. Aware of this, Jesus said, you have little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves that you do not have bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you collected? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many large baskets you collected? Why is it you don't understand that when I told you, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, it wasn't about bread? Then they understood that he had not told them to beware the leaven in bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All right, let's pray and see what God would have for us today. So again, Father, uh, as always, we need your help. <clears throat> help us have open hearts and minds, soft spirits towards your Holy Spirit as you speak to us today, through your scriptures, by your Spirit. We want to, in every way, grow up into the likeness of your Son, Jesus. We don't want to just import our own ideas or understanding into this text, but to hear from you today. Make us more like Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen. Uh, so if we could set the scene a little bit, like when Jesus met the religious leaders, he had, if you go to the chapter before, he just had this amazing run of miracle after miracle after miracle, culminating in the feeding of 4,000 men plus women and children. So we're talking thousands and thousands of people. Miraculously, Jesus takes a small amount and turns it into an amazing amount with just seven loaves and a few small fish. Matthew 15 finishes by saying, after dismissing the crowds, so thousands of people, maybe uh, 10 or some scholars say, maybe even 20,000 people, because they're only counting the men, but if there are women and children, there could be many, 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 many more. It says, after dismissing the crowds, he got into a boat and went to the region of Magadan or Magdala, maybe your version says. So Jesus on a boat by himself, <clears throat> heads off, gets to the new region, lands in the new region, and then the Pharisees and Sadducees come specifically to test Jesus. So the Pharisees, you've probably heard of the Pharisees before. Uh, and even if you haven't, you've likely heard the word before spoken in a kind of a, an insulting or pejorative kind of sense. So you Pharisees or you Pharisee, meant as someone who's very legalistic, but perhaps doesn't live up even to their own standards. Perhaps is how we might, <laughs> what we might say of a, of a Pharisee. The Sadducees, perhaps lesser known, uh, these are both religious leaders of the day, both kinds of more like political parties of the day. They did not really get along. They were on kind of opposing sides. In fact, <clears throat> if you fast forward into, um, into the book of Acts uh, and uh, with the apostles, it's really funny where uh, there's one situation where uh, Paul finds himself confronted by these two political parties, religious leaders against him, 
And he's thinking, how am I, what am I going to do here? And so he talks about the resurrection because he knew the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, which is why my, my, my dad always used to say, that's why they were so sad, you see? <laughs> and so they start arguing and Paul kind of like, creeps out, kind of Scooby-Doo style. No, he doesn't really creep out, but that's how he gets out of the situation because these are not really, they're not really friends uh, until they're united in their quest to get Jesus, which is what's happening here. They were already, they were already pretty frustrated at Jesus because none of them had been able to kind of catch him out. None of them had been able to test him and win. None of them had been able to ask him a question that he couldn't answer. <clears throat> so they're very frustrated and more and more and more people were following him. And again, just the very last thing that had happened, thousands and thousands of people came to Jesus. Didn't come to know Jesus. But they came to follow him, came for what he was able to give them. And these Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious leaders come to Jesus and they say, show us a sign, Jesus. I mean, he's just... All he's been doing is signs. The whole chapter before, a different region for sure. Now he's across the, you know, across the lake. All he's been doing is science. I don't know if you've ever heard this of somebody. I've heard this uh, more times than I can count, I think, where people would say something like, well, if Jesus would just, if God would just make himself known to me, if he'd just perform a sign for me, if he'd just come down here and speak to me, then I would believe. This is basically just the first century version of that. If God came down here right now and showed himself, then I'd believe. And they're saying this to, uh, to Jesus about Jesus. If you could just show me that you're God, show me this sign, then I will believe. That's not really what they're saying. They're not, they're not actually authentically, genuinely asking Jesus for a sign so that they might believe in him. They're just trying to trap him. They're trying to expose him, actually. So they're very disingenuous in this, uh, in this moment. They're questioning Jesus, testing Jesus. Again, they're united only in the same thing that every other error is united in, and that's in, in its opposition to Jesus as Lord. So it's really important to understand this. We have many religious leaders in our day. Uh, I would suggest the dominant religion in our day, or at least in Australia, is uh, what's become known as expressive individualism, has become the dominant religion of the day. We have uh, bishops <clears throat> in politics and in the media who are the, you know, the, the pillars who are upholding this religion. Uh, the preachers are on TikTok and Instagram. The pastors are in our schools. And it is the dominant, not just philosophy, but religious worldview of our day various strands and sects who, who may not agree on anything else other than their opposition to Jesus as Lord. And we see this often as these, in every other sense, warring parties come together just in their opposition to Christianity. It's amazing, actually. And if you want to be a light in your world, in your context, uh, you're going to get people asking these same kind of questions. Well, show me. I don't believe you. It's going to take a miraculous sign from heaven. Otherwise, uh, no, no dice. I don't believe you. And like these religious leaders in their encounter with Jesus, they can be wise and knowledgeable in many ways. Jesus even identifies this. He says, guys, you can, you can identify the, the signs in the sky. You're asking for a sign from heaven you're already looking to the heavens, in the natural at least. You can discern those times. You're, you are wise and knowledgeable in some ways, just like the religious leaders of uh, the dominant religion of our day are wise and very knowledgeable in some ways. But just like Jesus shows these religious leaders, he says, but you are totally ignorant when it comes to the greater spiritual things. Jesus says, this is what he says. When evening comes, you say, it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. Jesus is 
Sounds like he's getting a little bit sarcastic with them. These are the religious leaders of the day. These are the people who should know better. These are the ones who've been looking forward to Jesus coming. These are the ones who have memorised so much of Scripture to put us to shame. And Jesus is saying, you should know better. You, you have no idea, actually. In the prior chapter, this is what Matthew records. It says, Jesus went up on a mountain and sat there, and large crowds came to him, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, those unable to speak, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd was amazed when they saw those unable to speak talking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they, and they gave glory to the God of Israel. And again, if that wasn't amazing enough, he then goes on to feed thousands of them, at, almost out of thin air, just from a few loaves. They don't want a sign to authenticate Jesus as God. It's not really what they're looking for. They're trying to either demand something spectacular for their own enjoyment, or we've heard you can do miracles. We want to see a miracle too. Or they're just trying to catch him out. And Jesus again tells them, they can read the signs in the natural, but they have no eyes to see the spiritual signs. And then he really gets to kind of the, the, the greater, the essence of the matter. He says, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. He says, you're demanding a sign from me. I've, I've been doing signs all the stinking time. And now you come to me and say, show me your sign. There's only an evil and adulterous generation. Evil, someone who is operating against God. And these are the people who are supposed to be representing God. An adulterous, someone who has run after another love. And this is what he says to them. He says, you purport to be, you're supposed to be, the people who are pointing everybody else to God. And yet, you are God's you're working against God. You're supposed to love God above all else, but you've totally missed him because you've run after another love. And then he finishes with this kind of mic drop statement. He says, but no sign will be given to it, that evil and adulterous generation, other than the sign of Jonah. So they want to look up and experience something, some external spiritual sign. <clears throat> and Jesus says, you're not going to get that. Well, actually, you are going to get that, but you're going to miss that too. He says, you're only getting the sign of Jonah. And that's it. He kind of, you know, mic drop and walks off. And what do signs do? Signs point to something. They signify something. I spent three years at uni studying signs, so I could really go on about this a lot. Um, but everything, anything can be a sign. Anything can denote meaning or contained significance from how you style your hair to the clothes that you choose to um, any, anything at all, the words that you use. What these people are looking for is something that pointed to Jesus' authority and his authenticity in his claim to be who he was. And he says, you're not going to get any sign. He says, instead, he reveals the spiritual condition of their heart. He says, you're not actually looking for God. You're working against him and you're pursuing other loves. What he hears is a request for a spectacular sign, <clears throat> but how he responds is to go to what is of the most importance, the, the greatest significance, the state of their heart. Their, their state of rebellion against God and not just them personally, but them then leading other people away from God. It is a disastrous state to be in. Well, another time when Jesus does perform a sign, the religious leaders say, well, it's by Satan that he's driving out Satan. So even when he does the signs, they don't believe him. And when he does the signs, they want to see more. Or when he does the signs, they say, wow, that doesn't prove anything. What Jesus says is, you want a sign? I'll give you the sign of Jonah, pointing to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
What's the sign that authenticates Jesus as God among us? It's his power over death. What is the sign that Jesus consistently and constantly points to? It's his vicarious death and his victorious resurrection. And what is the sign that the apostles throughout the rest of Scripture point to? And what's the sign that we continue to point to? It's a sign of Jesus' vicarious death and victorious resurrection. Jesus says, that's the sign. You can look up in the sky and you can discern the, the, these are not dumb people. These are not unintelligent people, but these are foolish people because I've missed the sign, the sign of Jonah. He's already told them, like back in chapter 12, he says, like Jonah, I'll be in the earth for three days, like Jonah was in the belly of the fish. And, and one greater than Jonah is among you. Jesus has already told them. He's not hiding the ball. He's not kind of trying to obfuscate things. Like he says in another, in another place, he says, well, I talk in parables all the time so that I could fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah that they'll be ever hearing and never seeing. But here he's pretty explicit. He says, Jonah, Jonah. They want a symbol. Jesus says, what about the greatest symbol, the greatest miracle? Death is defeated. Sin is conquered. Our rebellion is overturned. Enemies are made sons and daughters. That's the thing that Jesus points to. That's the sign that Jesus wants them to see. That's the sign he wants them to understand the significance of. For us, uh, we often see many signs of Jesus' lordship in our life. Dozens and hundreds and thousands of the evidence of God's grace in our lives scattered throughout our lives over and over and over again. And above every of all of those little signs, every single other sign is this one great sign. Jesus' vicarious death and his victorious resurrection. That he loves you. And because of God's love for you, he has made a way to overcome your and my sin, our rebellion, our shame, and even our death. And because of his great love, he's made a way for us to be reconciled with him in Christ forever. It's the greatest news of all time. And this is where Jesus kind of leaves the mic drop. And then just like we saw last week in in last week's encounter, the disciples have finally caught up to Jesus. And Jesus does this little thing where he says, let's let's go over what just happened here. (laughs) Let's Let's have a chat. So um, Jesus' disciples join him. He's still thinking about his interaction with the religious leaders. And this is what he tells his disciples. He says, watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the disciples, they're still thinking, they didn't witness this encounter. They're still thinking, feeding the 4,000, collected all that bread. They're thinking, oh my goodness, we forgot the bread. (laughs) We didn't bring any bread with us. Oh boy, and Jesus tells him, it's not about the bread. He's saying, stop just looking to these signs in the natural when I'm trying to reveal the greatest spiritual truths to you, the things of greater significance. They they are also mistaking internal meaning for external messages. Then they understand. Jesus says, it's not about the bread. And they're like, oh yeah, okay. He's talking about the teaching of the religious leaders of the day who have proven evil and adulterous. And when he says evil, he's not saying evil how we might say evil in our day, <clears throat> which means someone who's really bad and uh, like tortures puppies and things like that. He's talking about the very ordinary kind of evil. Even these people who from from everything in the natural, seem like they're the closest to God. The people would look at them and hold them up on a pedestal, deferring to them, their expertise, their wisdom, their teaching. They said, these people know God. And Jesus is saying, they're the ones who are far from God. They're the ones that are running to other loves. He's comparing them to evil and adultery. He says, don't, don't look at the things in the natural. When he talks about the leaven, 
what he's talking about is, is it's a throwback to uh, Proverbs and previous teaching, talking about how they wouldn't make bread. And if they're making flat bread, say for, for Passover, with no yeast in it, no, nothing leaven, so that the bread doesn't rise, <clears throat> uh, if any leaven gets into the bread, the bread rises. And so what Jesus is saying is, man, even if a tiny little bit gets in there, the whole loaf is ruined. You can't use it for, say, the Passover anymore. If it's going to be flat, it can't have any leaven in it. If it's going to be useful, if it's going to be holy, like set apart for this particular purpose, cannot have any leaven in it. And Jesus is saying, beware the leaven, just the little bit of these people that in the natural you look up to with human, like with, with fleshly eyes, you look up to and go, wow, these, these people, they can discern the times. They can discern, look how wise they are. They can read the sky. They've memorized massive chunks of scripture. Just beware. Jesus frustrated with his disciples' lack of understanding. He says, don't you get it yet? Don't you understand? He's trying to say, remember, this is, this is actually about me, is what Jesus is saying. Remember how I fed the 4,000. Remember how I fed the 5,000. Don't listen to the Sadducees, he's saying. They don't even believe in the resurrection. He says, that's the main sign I'm going to do among you. Don't listen to them. Don't take in their tiny little bits because it's going to ruin the whole loaf. Don't listen to the Pharisees who want to distract you away from, what I, from who I am what I've come to do. There's a little leaven, a little bit of the teaching of these evil and adulterous leaders, seemingly so wise, seemingly so knowledgeable, but totally missing the greater spiritual significance of who Jesus is, what he's come to do, and what that means for us. So it's a tough word for the disciples. It's a tough word for us. We must not compromise on the truth. We can't. Not even a little bit. But we're the leaven, just a tiny little bit, is what he's saying. We need to contextualize the truth. We need to communicate the truth. We need to live the truth, like actually that our lives would reflect what we believe, that our lives are actually, in a sense, prophetically proclaiming what we believe about the Lordship of Jesus, a trust in Him. For us, it means we need to, <clears throat> we need to root out the false or foolish or frivolous, destructive teaching and thinking that comes from people who miss Jesus. We've got to do the work, build a strong foundation of faith in Jesus upon the teaching of the apostles. That's what the Bible commends for the, for the first believers. It says they dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's why we're so big on Scripture here and trying to understand Scripture. We don't know what does the scriptures say the things that are records of or from the apostles. It will mean for us, in our discipleship groups, in our families, in our neighbourhoods, in our workplaces, um, there will be leaven everywhere trying to sneak into the life. If you're on social media, leaven. Every stinking reel. Leaven. Watching... I mean, any, any, consuming any kind of um, artistic expression, there's going to be leaven. I'm not trying to say, like, burn all your books and burn all your things. I'm saying uh, watch and read broadly and enjoy broadly and don't incorporate any of that leaven into your, into your uh, worldview. It means our job, first for ourselves and then for others, the people we're serving among, as uh, so we understand, as so we teach and lead people around us in the truth of who Jesus is, what he came to do, and what that means for us in the world. Again, we would be pointing to the greatest sign of all, Jesus' vicarious death, like in our place on our behalf, and his victorious resurrection, defeating death, inviting us into his family, even into unity with him. This is the story of this encounter with Jesus. Let's pray together. So Father, I want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. 
that, that you have opened up our eyes, like the, our spiritual eyes, to see and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Father, not because we're really awesome, but because you are so gracious and generous to us. And so thank you. We don't, we don't want to be, I mean, in any way uh, puffed up with any sense of arrogance or that we have earned this or we deserve this. We're just in awe of your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. And so help us, Father, to fix our eyes on Jesus, his vicarious death, his victorious resurrection, uh, him seated at your right hand even now, interceding on our behalf, our big brother, you our father. It's the most wonderful, phenomenal truth of all time. And so let help us. Uh, when we're thinking about other people, Father, and uh, when we're, go- we're just going through our lives normally, now please help us to discern what is good, what is true, what is right, to receive the things that come from you, to reject the things that aren't of you. Father, we wouldn't be like the religious leaders that look great on the outside, look great to people around them, but totally miss Jesus. Father, we want to be the people who see Him, acknowledge Him, glory in Him, worship Him, walk with Him, and invite others into a relationship with Him. Father, help us to do this in the power of Your Spirit, uh, with the power of Your Gospel, and in and through Your great love for us. In Jesus' name, Amen.